Hi guys, welcome back to OC Avery and welcome back to the Natives and Norwich Zoom Room. Now today we have part two of our Zoom Rooms with Mr. Dave Henderson. We, uh, we we have part two because we had part one several months ago covering bird health and medication. So today is part two and what we're going to cover is again bird health and medication but different things that we didn't cover last time such as using doxycycline, uh, egg binding in birds and actually uh, controlling the calcium and then uh, ju just uses of different medications needed quantities doses and things like that uh, and that's just a few of the things so i hope you enjoyed today's video and i'm sure you'll find some useful tips hello and welcome back to the natives and norwich zoom room now today we are on part two with mr dave henderson so thank you for joining us dave obviously uh, our part one on bird health and medication was uh, a big success a lot of people really enjoyed that so we're back with part two now we'll go straight into the questions so with the breeding season now in full swing many fanciers may experience egg binding with some of their hens uh, could you explain to us how egg binding occurs and how it can be treated and how it could be prevented? I mean, we, we covered that off in quite a bit of depth, actually, the first the first one of these videos we did. Um, but I guess just, just to recap, I mean, egg binding really is caused by the hen, a hen not being able to pass an egg or lay an egg, you know. And, you know, you could speculate why that is, but my reckoning has always been that um, it's a deficiency in calcium that causes the problem. I mean, I say a deficiency in calcium, I mean the blood calcium levels low because there's more than enough calcium in a hen's body you know, all birds and humans yeah. and all mammals all, all animals of bones how you know they can mobilize the, the calcium in their bones quite quickly actually push the blood level of calcium up and therefore that creates enough enough you know calcium and the calcium obviously as far as eggs are concerned the, the eggshells made of calcium phosphate because there's a big demand there on the hen in terms of physically producing the egg and then there's calcium required and the muscular contraction um, to expel the egg. So there's two things going on there. There's, there's the demand to make the egg and there's also the demand in terms of its muscles. So if a hen's blood calcium level isn't high enough, then that might cause a problem. She, she may be able to produce the egg, but might just not have enough calcium there to actually produce enough strong muscular contraction to expel the egg out of the, the egg tract, you know? Yeah. Um, that's really what I think causes it. And you know, egg, you know, the egg production, the whole, the whole process is, is you know, the, the, the calcium in the bloodstream is controlled by three or four different hormones. And I've got this theory that, particularly in the early part of the season, a lot of hens, the calcium, the, 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 the hormonal system is not kicked in sufficiently to allow all that to happen and therefore produce enough calcium. And I think that's why it happens. Yeah. You know? So, Pretty... you know, go, on, go on, sorry. Yeah, no, no that's, that, that's, that's great. Um... You know, obviously, um, yeah, something like that, a bit of something which you wouldn't usually think about, actually, just the hormones uh, kicking in to control the calcium. I mean, I used to, when I was, when I was with the birds, I always, I always used to find that egg binding was more likely to happen early on in the season, the first round or so. Once they got going and started breeding effectively and the warmer weather came on and so on, I think the hormonal system kicked in and I very rarely had hens egg binding, you know, in the month of June or July or whatever like that. It was always early on, late March, early April, first round you'd usually find the problem. Yeah. And the simple way to get around it is just to give the hens a calcium supplement, a liquid calcium supplement, just before they start to lay the first the first clutch of eggs. You know, as you see the hen build the nest, she's starting to sit on it before she lays, get the calcium in, into the drinker then. Liquid calcium, not not yeah. a solid powder, because a lot of these solid calcium powders don't really dissolve in water. They just float in the top or sink to the bottom. So you want a liquid calcium um, in, in the drinking right. water for two or three, four days or so before the hen starts laying and that should hopefully prevent the problem. If a hen does, even despite that, if a hen does get egg bound, all you would, the best thing to do, and what loads of guys and mothers, is to warm up a little bit of oil. Olive oil is as good as anything. What I would use, what I used to, there's two things I would, I would used to do. I would, I would either um, take a teaspoon, run, down, run it under a hot tap, put some olive oil on a teaspoon, that warms olive oil, and just take the olive oil on my finger and rub it in a bird's vent and then put it in a hospital cage or, or in the show cage near a radiator and the heat alone will just make the hens you know egg tract expand and she'll pass egg quite easily either yeah. that or, or just put the hen in the hospital cage quite often just the warmth of a hospital cage you'll go back half an hour later and the egg will be lying on the bottom of the cage the hen will pass past it so Got you. quite simple it's quite, it's quite simple to fix if you catch it quick enough in a hen and you spot it yeah I was going to say, if if not, it generally, you know, it, it goes downhill quite quickly. Then, doesn't it? If yeah, uh, if yeah. you if you're late yeah. on that. Now, yeah. um, 
talking about going light so using baycocks uh, should this be diluted using chlorinated tap water or should we use something else like distilled water or reverse osmosis water um, and, and why would you choose this I'm, I'm not aware that the baycocks needs to needs to be diluted using anything other than tap water right I'm, I'm not aware you need to use any other form of water was I'm this not, Something on maybe doxycycline. Um, yeah, do doxycycline. You definitely sorry. have to use do distilled water, but, yeah. but not they're not baycocks. Baycocks you just use ordinary tap water to dilute it down. Doxycycline is right. different. It's used for ornithosis, and just the chemical structure of the tetracycline antibiotics that bind really strongly to metallic ions, so calcium, manganese, sodium, anything like that at all, and they will bind to that and, and that inactivates the, the the drug, but not with baycocks. Right, so ordinary okay. water should be perfectly okay with it. Okay, so just on that with doxycycline then, um, so what would you say would be better using sort of like distilled water? Um, yeah, I mean, there's different types of water. You, you've, you've got distilled water. All that distilled water is is, is, is boiled and vaporised and condensed back down to liquid. Yeah. So distilled water, it properly, distilling water doesn't really remove all the, all the minerals out of it. That's what you want to remove is the metallic minerals, yeah? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily move them all. The best stuff at the whole lot is deionized water. Now, deionized right. water, deionized water, is what you get in the garages and they put it in batteries. Because yes. car batteries, if you were in an acid battery, you would not want to put any sort of water in it that's got metallic ions and it. it would just completely ruin the battery. So really, oh, yeah. you know, you've got the Tesco or some places like that or, or garages, you can buy big tubs or big canisters of deionized water. Now, deionized water has been put through a, a, a system called electrolysis, and it actually physically removes all the metallic ions out of it. Yeah. That's the best stuff to use. Got reverse reverse osmosis water, all that is, but reverse osmosis, osmosis, you force the water through a membrane that removes all the big sort of particles and stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily, again, remove all of the all of the metallic ions. So the reverse osmosis water, whilst it's good for drinking, it tastes very clean to drink, it's not necessarily the right stuff to use for doxycycline. Deionized water is what you need. Okay, got you. So, um, what what did you say actually happens then? So, if you wasn't to use deionized water, it reacts with the um, yeah the doxycycline, and, and what does that yeah. cause in the bird? Well, it, it just inactiv inactivates the drug. It wouldn't harm the bird, right? It just okay. you're using a drug at your waste your time, really. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Oh, so it oh, just, oh, just has no effect. Yeah. Well, all drugs. I mean, if you look at nature, chem chemical compounds, yeah, a lot of them yeah. are chemically charged. So you might remember your proton protons and, and electrons. You know, a any sort of molecule or atom with a negative charge in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's got, it's got a minus charge, and it. it has an affinity to bind to something with a positive charge. Now, all the metals, calcium, manganese, cobalt, you, you know, iron, any any metal. They are always positively charged. The ions are positively charged. Yes. Yeah. And 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 and, do, and, and doxycycline, its molecule, tends to be negatively charged. It's got it's got an overall negative charge in it. Therefore, ah, okay. You know, the metallic ions act like a like a like a magnet to it. They just stick, stick to it. And when they bind to it, they just completely inactivate it. So ah, that's the problem. So you okay. have to use deionized water that's got no positive metallic ions in it. Yeah, that can bind to that that doxycycline's negative charged molecule and and, and ruin it basically. Yeah, got what you. What the bottle? Well, well, yeah, well, yeah. Th thank you for the advice. That is, uh, yeah, r really useful. Now um, on to canker, also known as uh, trichomonosis. Um, yeah. This can affect pigeons uh, and finches. Now, what are the symptoms of this, and what can we use to treat it? Well, the, the main the main symptom of of canker in any bird is if you look inside its throat, you'll see these white or yellowish deposits. Almost okay. looks like curd or cheese. That's what it looks like. Now, in a pigeon, you can see it really easily. You open the beak up and look inside. You'll see inside the cheeks, on the back of the throat, inside. There's this kind of yellow, um, like I say, it just looks like curd or cheese. That's what it's like. You know, cottage cheese. It's not yeah. quite white. It's yellow, you know, smelling. There's something got a smell of it as well, actually. In smaller birds, it's harder to see that because if you open up a beak and look inside, they've got such a tiny, you know, tract inside their mouth. It's quite hard to see it. Yeah. But you can see it quite often. You, you are. If you've got a magnifying glass, open this beak and have a look. You'll see it inside. But the other symptom you see in small birds is you'll often see it in their eyes, their watery eyes. Because what canker does is not only does it choke up the throat, it chokes, or chokes up the eye canals as well. The, the whole bird's nasal passages and everything gets blocked. 
yeah. and therefore what happens is as I start to acclimate, they start to stream and quite often in small birds you'll, you'll see that stickiness if you like their eyes will be streaming they'll look watery and just below the eyes and the feathers will go all matted and sticky that's sometimes in birds that's small birds that's the first symptom you'll see is the eyes looking watery and sticky now yeah. the only thing you want to watch with that though is that's also a very common symptom of ornithosis so sometimes it can be difficult to diagnose the difference between canker and ornithosis just looking at the eyes because in both cases the eyes will be watery and streaming you know yeah but to really get the proper diagnosis and decide if it's canker or not you'd have to look inside the bird's throat Got now it. once you've diagnosed that if, if you know that's what they've got it's easy to treat there's a bunch of drugs called the uh, imidazole antibiotics metronidazole is one it's commonly used in humans as well that drug but you've also got like um ronidazole and di dimetridazole R ronidazole was the very first drug i think it was used my dad used it 50 years ago on his pigeons you know and it was quite effective in the pigeons but then they brought another one out called di dimetridazole that's pretty good mtro is the brand name of that one that most people will be familiar with and the dosage uses 100 milligrams to a litre of water and that put the birds on that and that'll it usually clears it up fairly quickly got you brilliant thank you very much now um what just on that with uh how we'd said about uh, similar sort of symptoms um what's your thoughts on actually like mixed drugs dr uh, use of mixed drugs in our aviculture like like the shotgun approach uh, as it's been yeah. referred to uh, obviously bearing in mind you, you're going on an educated guess here to try to diagnose something sick mm. um you know quite quickly so what, what yeah. do you think on that approach um I, I, I'm a pharmacist, and, and human medicine we generally don't use that approach, you know. Yeah. But it, it's much, much easier to diagnose in humans medical conditions than it is in birds, because we can speak, we can describe symptoms and stuff, but you can't get that in a bird, can you? They can't speak exactly. for themselves. Yeah. Most these dogs can't seem to sort of thing. It's very, very, it's much, much harder to diagnose in, in, in those than it is in humans. And generally speaking, in human medicine, we don't use a scattergun approach. We find out what is wrong and use the correct drug to treat it. Now, even in even in, in in medicine for birds, veterinary medicine for birds in this country, we tend to use single drugs and not use that scattergun approach. But in the continent, we do. They quite often put, you know, for respir you'll have a four in one respiratory powder, and it'll have four different drugs in it. And I'm just guessing as to which disease it might be. Put all four drugs in for mycoplasmosis, ornithosis, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and hopefully one of them will, will hit the hit the you know yeah do, do the job type thing. The, the only problem that approach is you can maybe cure the bird or fix it, but you still don't know what disease the bird's actually had. And therefore, when it gets it again, you're back at square one again, using this one in four, four to one product. You never quite get to the level where you diagnosed it. I think what's much better practice would be if you've got a sick bird and you're unsure what it is, take it to a vet and try and get a definite diagnosis. And the vet will give you the correct drug to treat the disease rather than just keeping using multiple drugs. Because the risk is, if you use a drug, if you use a product that's got four different drugs in it, and let's say, let's for, say for sake of argument, the bird's got mycoplasmosis, right. and one of those drugs in that four, in that that pack of, in that four in one product happens to be a macrolide antibiotic, which would treat mycoplasmosis, great. You you don't know that's what the bird's had though, do you? That, that's the problem. Yeah, and, exactly. And therefore, to try and find out what it is, you know, yes, you you better get a proper diagnosis. But the risk you've got is the other three drugs which are in that medicine, in that product, which the bird hasn't got the disease for those three, you're exposing the bird and any bacteria inside it to those three drugs and therefore potentially build up resistance to those diseases. So you might treat the mycoplasmosis and later on down the line, lo and behold, you get a whole problem with ornithosis because that, that you've been using a drug for ornithosis, that's not what the bird's had. You've just weakened the immune system doing that. Right. That makes got sense. You. Yeah, yeah, completely understand. Um, yeah, so so really, you would suggest the better option would be really getting a, a correct sort of diagnosis to yeah. to hit that cor correctly. Yeah, and vets are the best people to do that. I mean, it can take swabs yeah. of birds and get them tested, all sorts of stuff, and try and get a definite diagnosis. I would, the other thing I would say about vets as well. Sometimes the vets is a guessing game for these guys as well. You know, they might recommend a certain treatment because they think it's such and such, and lo and behold, it isn't such and such. It's something else. Yeah, but you can't blame the vet for that. You know the. the you know they're, they're doing their best to try and diagnose and therefore eventually they'll get to the root of the problem and treat it 
Yeah, well, I think uh, especially avian vets are quite few and far between. Uh, you know, they are, yeah, that's, something that's a problem. Common. Yeah, well, hopefully I'm going to fill that gap in a few years' time. So, yeah. Is that what, <laughs> yeah. you, is that yes. what you're doing? Yeah, you've got to yeah. be a vet, yeah? Yeah, that's the plan. Uh, you, uh, uni good. in September. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah now, um, we're going on to sort of drug doses and what. So, uh, how would you work out the correct dose of a drug? Um. I guess um, this is something I quite often get asked. People send me messages or text messages or whatever. Dave, I want to use such and such a drug. What's the dose, right? So I guess the first thing is to know what the dose is the drug you're using, the, the drug you're after, right? Yeah. So, you know, the recommended dose may be 200 milligrams of drug to a litre of water for five days, or it might be 500 milligrams of drug to a litre of water for 10 days, right? The first thing is you need to know what the recommended therapeutic dose is for the drug. Right. Now that's not easy to find. <laughs> I've got a textbook that I, I use and I've been using it for years, the British Veterinary Formulary. And when you end up doing your vets course, you'll end up with that book in your hand as well, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a book there. You know, we have a thing in, in, in human medicine called the BNF, the British National Formulary. And it's basically like a Bible. It's got all the drugs in it, all the conditions, all the doses, all the side effects, everything. And the British Veterinary Fund is a little bit like that, actually. So it's got recommended doses for all different conditions. So I've got it in my hand here. So for example, um, dimetridazole, that drug I mentioned earlier on for canker, the, 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 the recommended dose here is 100 milligrams to a litre for finches. Yeah? Yeah. And doxycycline, which we spoke about earlier on, used for ornithosis, yeah. the recommended dose here is 500 milligrams to a litre. Yeah? Yeah. So that book tells me effectively all the different doses that's recommended for the various different conditions, right? So that's the yeah. first thing. The second thing is, if you know, let's say you're pretty sure your bug's got ornithosis, right, and you send away to some company, and they send you back doxycycline, you ain't got a clue how much doxycycline you're using, right? Yeah. And, but, if, but if we know that doxycycline, the recommended dose, is 500 milligrams per litre, then it's easy to work out if you know how to do it. So, if you get the product, the packet, the box, right, so the tub of the box, or the bottle, or whatever, right, there'll be one of two things written on it. that will tell you it's got doxycycline, say for the sake of argument, Doxycycline, five milligram, fifty milligram per mil, or doxycycline. This product contains doxycycline, one hundred milligrams per mil. Sometimes on a bottle that'll be written there. Okay. Yeah. Now it says if it tells you on the bottle that it's got doxycycline, one hundred milligram per mil. See, then to get five hundred milligrams, you dose that you need. You need five mils of that. Does yeah. that make sense? You take yeah. five mils and you put it into a liter, and that's your a solution for treating the buds. Okay. Yeah. So that's the best way. If they write on the on the on the packs the number of milligrams in a mill or whatever, or a number of milligrams in five mils, you can work out if you know what the recommended dose is. That's fine. Yeah. Where it causes a lot of confusion though is a lot of products are expressed by percentage. Yeah. By, by percentage, right? So you'll often get a product that will say, um, this this Beto, for example, right? Beto contains a drug called enrofloxacin. That's the drug. Yeah, and it's available on 2.5% strength, I think 5%, and I think 10%, right? Now, a 10% solution of any drug, you often see expressed as um, enrofloxacin, 10% um, weight per W stroke V. So W stroke V, yeah? yeah? What that means is weight per volume. What that really means is that in that bottle of liquid, that, li that volume, if you like, then it's got... Um, 10% of the drug added. You know, what that really means is 10 grams to 100 mils. Yeah. So a 10% solution is 10 grams to 100 mils off that solution. If you take 100 mils of that bottle, you've got 10 grams of drug in that 100 mils. Yes. Does that make sense, right? Yes, got you. So, so 10 grams to 100 mils is also equivalent to 100 milligrams in one mil. Yeah? Yes, so what you've got, yes, you've got, got you. Does that make sense, yeah? Yes, so, yeah. So a 10% solution is 100 milligrams in a mil of that. There's 100 milligrams of drug in that in a mil of that solution. Yeah. A 2.5% solution, so a 2.5% drug, is yep. 25 milligrams of the drug in a mil of that liquid. Yes. Yeah. A 5% yes, solution is 50 milligrams of drug in a mil of solution. Does that make sense? Yes. So, yeah, so, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you. if we go back, but if we go back to the doxycycline example, right? Let's say, for sake of argument, well, let's give three examples here, right? Let's say doxycycline. We've got three different 
options here in terms of the drug that we buy, that we buy in, right? Yeah. And let's say it happens to be a liquid. It's a liquid drug of doxycycline. And it's available in three different strengths. If it's 10% doxycycline, there'll be 100 milligrams in a mil. Now, if we want the drug dose to be 500 milligrams in a litre of water, we'd have to use five mils of that, wouldn't it? Because it's got 100 milligrams per mil. Yes. We want 500 milligrams, so we'd use five mils into a litre of drinking water. Yes. Or in the case of doxycycline, a litre of um, deionized water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's say we, we can't get our hands on 10% solution, but we can get our hands on 5% solution. We know the 5% solution's got 50 milligrams per mil of drug in it. Right? Exactly, yep. Yeah. And, we, and we want 500 milligrams yes. as a dose. So what we need is 10 mils of that solution because it's got yeah. 50 milligram per mil and we want 500 milligrams, so we want 10 mils of that solution. So we draw 10 mils into a syringe and put it into a liquid, into a litre, and that would be the dose. Got you. Right. That's, that's let's, brilliant. Yeah. Let, let's say, let's say though, we can't even get our hands on 5%. The stuff we can only get is 2.5%. Yeah, we so it's 2.5%. Aren't you? Two, two, yeah, exactly. So it's 25 mil, milligram per mil. Yeah. yeah. So 4 mil would be, a, would be 100 mils, but we want... Yeah, sorry, so four, four mil would be 100 milligram, and we want 500 milligrams, so we, we want five times that. We want 20 mils of that solution into yeah. our mixture. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's the best way to work it out, yeah? If you've got a percentage solution, understand that a 10% contains 100, 100 milligram per mil, a 5% is 5 milligram per mil. I mean, years and years ago, when I used to use sulfodimidine for the green finches that go in light, yeah. it was available in an injection that was 33%. That meant there was 33 grams in 100 mils. So 330 milligrams in a mil. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It was quite a concentrated solution, actually. Very concentrated, which was one of the reasons when I spoke last time about it freezing and going, you know, it goes dry powdery and stuff. It's because it's such a concentrated solution. It yeah. tends, to, tends to dry out quite quickly. Wow. For a minute. Well, that, I mean, that's brilliant. And I hope a lot of people uh, watching will have picked that up as well. Um, because yeah you, you need the correct doses don't you otherwise it, it's almost pointless doing it um well i mean the other, the other thing to add in there as well would be would be about um how careful or not you have to be with drug doses yeah so yeah. so every drug every single drug um has got side effects the whole lot of them i, I can't think of a single single drug and i know thousands of them that do not have side effects that all have side effects to some degree or another yeah yeah but there's a thing when, when we talk about drug doses we talk about a therapeutic dose so i mentioned earlier on doxycycline the recommended dose is 500 milligrams to a liter of water that's a therapeutic dose for treating small birds for ornithosis yeah yeah so a therapeutic dose if you give them a sub therapeutic dose that's lower than that's lower than recommended chances are it won't have the right effect it won't stop the disease or cure it all it'll do is expose the, the, the thing you're trying to treat actually to a low dose and therefore it'll become resistant to it. So there's a real risk in using sub-therapeutic doses, yeah? Yes, yeah. But there's also there's also a dose which would be an overdose, yeah? Yes. So you, you use too much and you overdose them. Now, the difference between, there's a thing called the therapeutic safety of margin in drugs. What that really is, right? You've got the therapeutic dose and with every drug or most of them, you can give a dose above that before you cause any damage or cause any problems. Yeah. yeah. And that's called the therapeutic margin of safety. So let's say for sake of argument, with doxycycline, the therapeutic, therapeutic dose is 500 milligrams per litre. If we gave 800 milligrams per litre, would that cause a problem? Is that dangerous? And if the drug's got a, a wide therapeutic margin, a wide therapeutic margin of safety, you can give a lot more without causing any problems, right? Yeah. Now, fortunately, fortunately, most of the drugs that we use in birds have got quite a wide therapeutic margin of safety. Most of them have. Yeah. But some of them some of them don't, you have to be careful. So those drugs that we mentioned earlier on, for example, for canker, ronidazole and dimetridazole, they've got a very narrow therapeutic margin of safety. So you have to make sure you get the dose absolutely bang on right then, because if you don't, and you give slightly too much, you'll end up with bad symptoms in the bird, gastric upset, vomit, and all sorts of problems. Yeah. yeah. But fortunately, the majority, of the, the majority of the antibiotics we use for birds I've got quite a wide therapy, therapeutic management safety. They, they don't cause too much problems. So you don't have to be 100% perfectly accurate with them in terms of yeah. your dosing. 
got you. So what would be um, sort of the risks of actually overdosing that and overstepping that margin? What, you know, uh, sort of sort of side effects yeah. and uh, yeah, ult- ultimately what could happen? Uh, well, that, that, that's all of that. That has all to do with individual drug and what the side effects are. Yes. Yeah. Now, I mean, one of the things you need to be careful about is that all drugs, pretty much all of them, are metabolised in, in the liver and kidneys. And the big risk of overdosing a, 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 a bird, and particularly when it's got a, a narrow therapeutic margin of safety, is you damage your kidneys and liver. Yeah. That, that's a big risk, actually. Um, other than that, the will have a lot, a lot of the antibiotics, the penicillins, for example, was years and years ago, when they were first discovered, they were finding when they were using them in children, it was causing deafness, it was causing damage to their ears. Because they, they didn't get the doses right, they were just trialling them way back in the day, 1940s or whatever it was, when they first discovered yeah. they caused problems. And that's one of the side effects of the penicillins and their sister drugs, the cephalosporin antibiotics. If you give too much, they can cause irreversible problems with the, with the hearing. They can damage the, the ears. Oh, right. Um, wow. I make wasn't you deaf, aware actually. of that. Yeah, they can make you deaf. So so all, all, different drugs have all got different sorts of side effects. You've just It depends on the individual drug. I couldn't sit here and go through them over here all night, actually. But, yeah, um, you got they've, you. They've all, they've all got side effects to create the lesser degrees. Yeah. Now, um, just on some of the, the common drugs that we, we were using birds, uh, could you just give us a couple of recommended doses on those? Right, well, if I, if I go through some of the common ones we use then, right? So, um, if I look at the, the formula here. So, dimutridazole, I've mentioned for canker, 100 milligram per litre for that one. Doxycycline, 500 milligram per litre. Enrofloxacin, which is Betrol, Betrol, yeah? yeah? 100 to 200 milligram per litre for five, five to 10 days. So that's quite, quite, you know, you'd probably use 100 milligram for smaller birds like red poles and siskins. And maybe for bigger finches like half inches or green finches, you might use 200 milligram per litre. Yes. So that suggests to me that drug's got quite a wide margin of safety in it because it's quite, and that's always double the dose. So 100 to 200 is double, yeah. you know, the smaller dose yeah. compared to the bigger one. So 100 to 200 milligrams per litre for five to 10 days. Um, what else have we got here? Metronidazole, which can be used for canker again, 100 milligram per litre. You have to watch with that one because again, if you over, if you do too much with that one, it can make them really vomit and sick. Um, sulfur, sulfidimidine, sulfidimidine is the original drug used for treating bone light and green finches. Yeah. yeah. 200, 220 milligram per litre for three days, repeat after two days. Now that's to treat a bug that actually has the symptoms of going light. That's not yeah. a preventative dose. Preventative dose, you use tiny, tiny amounts, half a dozen drops in your drinker. You know, right. that, that 33% drug I was talking about. Um, oh, yeah. Thailand, Thailand, and Thailand, 500 milligrams per litre for 14 days usually for Thailand. You know, yeah. that's for a respiratory disease known as mycoplasmosis. Um, Levamiso, this is an, one, actually an interesting one in the, in the comments. The last video that we did, Ollie, one of the drugs that I mentioned, a really effective wormer, is a drug called Levamiso, L E V. A-M-I-S-O-L-E, Levamiso. The recommended dose for that is 80 milligrams per litre, and you would use that for three days, put them on it. Brilliant for capillaria, for hairworm, and for roundworm as well. Really effective drug. Yeah. But I've narrowed therapeutic margin of safety in that one as well, so you have to make sure that you get 80 milligrams per litre and yeah. stick to that. Got you. So that would be that would be some of the common ones. Um, Fenbendazole. Fenbendazole is a common one as well. Panicker is the brand name. So for small finches, 50 milligram per litre for that one, for 24 hours usually. So that's kind of some of the common ones that we've got in here. That, um, that, that's brilliant. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate that. Um, just on the um, the, the, the worm of the, what was it? Liver miso. Liver miso. Um, yeah. where, where, where would you sort of source that? Would that be sort of a... a, a more of a vet prescribed drug? Or yeah, um... Pres- prescription only from a vet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, prescription okay. only from a vet. That that one actually. I mean, wormers you have to watch. There's there's loads of different wormers available on the market, and the vet. That one of the original ones is a drug called piperazine, or piperazine citrate. It was used for years and years in humans as well, actually. Um, and that's the if you go and buy a wormer, if you're able to buy a wormer, say you go online or whatever, or or you go to a pet shop, if you yeah. any pets at home and bought a wormer, chances are that would be piperazine citrate you're buying. Yeah, because right, it's available yeah. over the counter. It's one of the few wormers you can buy over the counter now. Okay, so 
but it's not very effective. A lot of the worms yeah. are resistant to it now. It, it doesn't really do a very good job. I wouldn't use that one. It's just, it's an old school drug that was used donkeys years ago. And it's, it's been superseded by fenbendazole and drugs like that. Ah, right. Got stuff, you. You know? Yeah, fair enough. Um, now we'll go carry on with bird, that bird going light and what. So, um, if Baycox or sulfadimidine uh, fails, some fanciers have actually had some success with. Let me pronounce this right. Trimethoprim sulfur. What yeah. would be a reason for this happening? Any ideas? So tri what, what trimethoprim sulfur is, right? It's a drug that was used in humans as well, called cotrimoxazole. That's what we used to call it, cotrimoxazole. It's got two drugs in it, actually. It's got a drug called trimeth trimethoprim, which is an, an antibiotic. Yep. Trimethoprim is still used in humans quite common. It's used for urine infections, yeah? And it's quite effective for urine infections. You only have to use it for about three days, and it, it, cures, it cures it, actually. You know? So yeah. what trimethoprim sulfur is, or cotrimoxazole, to give it its common name, for for every there's like a, the two drugs are in there. The two drugs are, are, are trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. So it's a sulfur drug, a sulfonamide antibiotic. Yeah. Yeah. And there's five times the amount of sulfonamide in it compared to trime, trimethoprim. Right. Now, I can remember many many years ago, a guy called Frank Meaden, who was a brilliant bird man, great breeder of birds. He, he, he did a lot of first breedings in this country as well of umpteen different types of birds. Right. Yeah. And I remember him writing years and years ago in Cage Birds about trimethoprim. It was effective against golden light, and I thought it's not because trimethoprim is not effective against golden light. Okay, yeah. So the sulfonoid part is very, very effective; it'll do the job, but trimethoprim won't. And the reason trimethoprim is in that mixture is quite often when a bird's got a problem that a sulfur drug will help, like atoxoplasmosis, the golden light. And yeah. um, the sulfur drug will help it, but often the bird in its gut will get a secondary infection. And that's what the trimethoprim did. The trimethoprim treated the second infections. It didn't pre treat the primary infection, the atoxoplasmosis. So, right. so when they say they're using Baycox and finding that's not very good or sulf sulfadimidine is not working, all they're basically doing is using a different sulfonamide antibiotic, i.e. Sulf sulfamethoxazole. The Got trimethoprim's in it extra. Does it help? It might help secondary infections, but it's not helping the primary problem. Right. Got you. Sense, yeah. yeah, yeah, understand. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so, um, there's another question here. Um, so, by pumping birds uh, full of medication supplements, this can have a, a negative impact on the liver uh, over time. Is there anything that we could do to sort of reduce the damage while still having the same effect uh, or anything to restore a damaged liver? Um, the, the liver is an incredibly tolerant organ as people who are alcoholics <laughs> can testify you know, the, the, the damage of liver by drinking huge amounts of alcohol for a long period of time and survive yeah. it um, so the, and the liver is able to heal itself actually it's just, you know it, it can heal and you can live a half a liver half an effective liver I mean a lot of people who are alcoholics for example you know, they're still alive and half the liver's not even working it's damaged irreparably but they can live a half the liver so yeah to come back to the original question I mean it's not a good idea to pump. I, you had me saying this in the previous previous video that we did. I'm dead against pumping, just routinely pumping birds full of drugs and well guesswork and stuff like that. You just yeah. shouldn't be doing that, you know. Um, and I know that we have to use either Baycox or, or the sulfonamide antibiotics to keep, take people light. Well, I have to do that, the birds would die. There's no option, right? But the idea with any of these drugs, the real key to it is to use the minimum dose that's effective. In other words, the minimum therapeutic dose and to use it for as, as short a period as you possibly can and then you won't damage the liver if you just keep banging high doses in irrespective the whole time you are going to damage the liver and will the liver recover probably not not only will you damage the liver though you damage the kidneys as well and completely kill the root of the bird kill it yeah so, so the best the best way to treat a damaged liver is don't give the drugs in the first place or stick rigidly to the recommended dose and don't go above it i mean if i give you a wee story about damaged liver right yeah yeah, I think again in the first video, I spoke a wee bit about paracetamol, and you'll be fully familiar with paracetamol. It's the most yes. common drug in this country used for humans, for sore heads, and all sorts of aches and pains. Paracetamol has a very, very narrow therapeutic margin, margin of safety. So the dose is 500 to 1,000 milligrams. That's one or two tablets, four times a day. If you use more than that, and you start taking 12 a day, and you do it on a regular basis, you will damage your liver irreparably. And in this country, there's huge numbers of accidental suicides every single year 
by people thinking, I've taken two to paracetamol, I've still got a sore head, I'll take another two and another two. And they end up not realising they're doing it, damage their liver. Another thing a lot of people do in this country as well is paracetamol is available in combination with codeine in a lot of different products. Yeah. Right. And the people, they, they want the codeine and a lot of people abuse the codeine, right? Now, these products have got paracetamol and codeine in them. Typically, the ones you can buy over the counter in a chemist shop, they've only got eight milligrams of codeine. And eight milligrams of codeine is not very effective. It's too low. You only need 15 to 30 milligrams of codeine to have an effect. So what do they do? They buy the codeine, and the, 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 the product with the paracetamol and codeine, and they take far too many of them to get the, the codeine effect. That, the codeine effect won't kill them, but the paracetamol they're taking is a huge dose, and that will kill them. And yeah. They take the of suicides through that as well. Wow. Because the, 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 the paracetamol damages the liver irreparably. Yeah. And a similar thing can happen with these, these when we've got, we talk about tiny little small buds, they've got a very high metabolic rate, their body processes drugs really quickly because the high metabolic rate, they've got a very high pulse rate and very high heart rate of heart, uh, heart rate. You shouldn't be doing that with buds, you just shouldn't be pumping them full of medicines, it's a bad, bad mistake to do that. Yeah. So you the minimum it. therapeutic dose for a short enough to a period of time it will have an effect, it's really going to be the recommendation. Got you, and, and just keeping that to only if you need to or rather yeah, than just absolutely yeah whacking yeah. them full yeah no yeah. fair enough mate um and that's some great advice for us to all pick up on um yeah you know you don't you don't want to go damaging birds like that um now young birds can commonly suffer from uh, black spot disease um what medication would you uh, sort of recommend to, uh, to treat this uh, and, and are there any other practices that we should adopt to reduce the chances of uh, young birds uh, sort of contracting this um black spot and in, in, in the years i was really active in the birds but in the early days nobody ever spoke about black spot nobody knew it existed i think it was only it was only first postulated that it was existed but 1995 it's 26 years it's been in the go that we've been aware of not a huge amount of time actually yeah. You know what it is, it's a, you know, it's a, you, you see young birds in the nest, little young birds, not a day or two after hatching, and you lift them out and look at their abdomen, just, but usually just below the breastplate, just below the, you know, the keel. Yes. You see a little black spot there, yeah? Yeah. And, it, you know, and, and, you know, the, the, the gallbladder gets wasted, um, various different internal organs in their gut just waste away as well. Now, the reckon... I mean, I guess that's a lot of speculation still about what causes black spot, right? But they reckon it's caused by a virus called the circle virus. It's been found in parrots and pigeons and everything else as well. But what they also know about, about that circle virus is adult birds can carry it and look perfectly okay. It can look perfectly fine. Yeah. So what happened, and also what they also know is that is, is the circle virus seems to be transmitted to very small birds through the egg. It's in the egg before the bird hatches. Yeah. Right. But it's protected, the chicken side egg is protected because the adult bird, the hen bird, can also pass on her immune system, you know, immunity to the, to the, yeah. to the, to the egg, right? Because what the, you know, the thing that, that it's protects you, you know, what your immune system is really all about is white blood cells and immunoglobulins, which are proteins. And there's yeah. all different types of immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, et cetera, et cetera. What they found in eggs is there's Ig, there's, I, there's immunoglobulins in the yolk and there's different immunoglobulins in the white of the egg as well. And what they're postulating about, about black spot, right, is that the actual virus is passed on and it's in the egg, it's put there by the hen effectively. But our antibodies, our antibodies that she puts in there as well, also protects it. But when the young bird hatches, yeah? Yeah. And it starts to get fed with adult birds and its immune system is not developed, then, then the virus starts to proliferate and it starts to cause problems, yeah? Yeah. And it weakens the immune system as well. The virus, the virus overtakes the bird's immune system and weakens it. And then what they think kills the young bird is secondary infections. Use the E. coli. So you've got yeah. a virus there caused this, this weakness, the, you know, and, and then E. coli use it or some other bacteria swamping the little bird and killing it. And they usually don't survive within bang, after three, four, five days. They'll just waste away. You quite often see these chicks actually. They'll be if they're able to do it, they'll be sticking their heads up and they'll look really thin and weak, just little weaklings, you know, they look red, their, their skin's pink and stuff as well. Yeah. Usually. So and then sometimes their guts will turn yellow, because that's just a rot inside with, with a bacterial infection in there. Can we treat the virus? Can we stop it? 
Probably no, because you can't really viruses, you know, you've no real control over them actually. And I think what they found as well is that when you use some of these um, antiviral products, they don't necessarily work. The virus will be in the environment. This circovirus, by the way, they reckon it's the smallest viral particle known to man. It's tiny. So all viruses are tiny. You can't see them in the naked eye. Yeah. The circovirus is particularly tiny and it can be carried around in dust. So one of the recommendations is keep the aviaries or sheds really ventilated, like plenty of fresh air going around, rather than being really, if you've got a really dusty environment, it kind of helps yeah. them proliferate, if you like. So try and keep the place clean. Keep plenty of air freshening around about. By all means, try and sterilise the cages when you clean them out. You know, using an antiviral Virconess or something like that might help. Um, but the question then is, if you've got these, these chicks in the nest and you notice this happening, can you treat it? Could you use an antibiotic, maybe? Which antibiotic would you use? You'd have to probably get them tested by a vet to work out the right one to use. It might be E. coli, it might be another, another bacterial species that's causing the problem. Right. Very, very difficult to treat. It's very, very hard to treat that. And I think, you know, yeah. like I say, it's a virus, it's adult birds carry it. An interesting thing they reckon as well, young hens are more likely, you're more likely to get this with young hens than, than adult hens. And the reason for that is I reckon when the bug gets older, it develops more resistance and its immune system strengthens. Right. So you might find that he adult hens, over a year hens or whatever, the second or third year breeding, maybe what they're doing is they're passing on a stronger immunity to the chicks in the egg and them in the hatch by feeding them, that immunity is stronger. Whereas in Got young it. hens, it's not really developed sufficiently. So you're yeah. more likely to find it with young hens, so they reckon. Right, okay. I know that... Um... At least this this was on the I believe it was on the Canary Room actually Matt Elder spoke about this was uh, if you not noticing young birds with black spot putting them in the nest with a different hen so actually perhaps um, trying them with a different hen and over year hen actually would be a yeah. sort of a, yeah. a, an option to mm -hmm. uh, tackle that so so it's more just about the young bird just making sure uh, providing the the mother is feeding. It, sh it realistically should be okay because it's getting those antibodies. Yeah, I mean, I mean your point there that by moving a chicken into another nest or another hen, maybe she's got a stronger immune system and therefore we'll pass it on. But the risk in doing that is you put that infected chick into a nest with, say, good chicks and yeah. infect them as well and cause problems to yourself. It's a yeah. tough one. Um, you know, you know what? There, there is the solution to it, right? There is a solution, but it's not been developed yet, and that is a vaccine. Because the best way to treat viruses is to get vaccination against them. We're doing that with, with COVID-19 at the moment. It's, <laughs> yes. a huge, it's been a huge success. The, the level of mortality and deaths has dropped massively, particularly in this country, because um, we've had so many adult people vaccinated. The real solution to black spot long term is to get a vaccine to it. It's highly unlikely that will ever happen to small birds because it's not economically viable for a company to do it. Yeah. So we'll be stuck with that, unfortunately. It's just a, it's just a pity, you know? Yeah, I guess... Um... Realistically, it's um, well. It, it's not like we use them commercially for <laughs> egg production. You don't see exactly, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, packs yeah, of canary yeah. eggs. So, yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> the Welcome Foundation are highly likely to spend twenty million pound developing a vaccine for small canaries and finches. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, I can you imagine the price of that? <laughs> oh God, you know, it'd be, yeah, yeah, it'd be obscene. Actually, yeah, it would be obscene. Yeah, definitely. Um. Now, clear eggs can be caused by a, a number of factors in birds, such as l low fitness um, and high infertility, but can also be caused by uh, chlamydia and ornithosis. So, what medications would you recommend to treat these in our birds, and uh, what for time, like what sort of time period should these be administered? Um, what specifically for ornithosis? Yeah, so ornithosis and chlamydia in the birds. Well, the one in the same. I, I think I, I think in our, the first video that we did, I'm, I need to go back and read it, but I look at it again. But I, I'm pretty sure I made a mistake, and I said that um, ornithosis was was caused by uh, um, what did I say? It was it was caused by protozoal diseases. No, chlamydia are a type of microorganism who live in their own right. If you you know, they're a group of microorganisms. Yeah. And ornithosis is also. Ornithosis is a chlamydia infection. So right. there's three things, there's three ways you can do that of, often in di different types of birds. We call it ornithosis. The parrot men or the foreign bird men call it psittacosis, but it's also called chlamydiosis, and it's a chlamydia microorganism that causes it. 
Right. Three three different okay. names about what, what type of bugs you're talking about, yeah? Yeah. And of course, you know, we, we spoke earlier on about how you how you, you treat that using doxycycline, you know, um, yeah. 500 milligram per mil. Now, the doxycycline, this chlamydiosis or ornithosis, call it what you want, it's very, very resistant to treatment, yeah? So the when, when the birds have got ornithosis and you're treating them for it, they'll keep passing it through their droppings. They'll keep on doing that, right? Right. So, something I probably didn't mention the last time that when you're treating the birds for ornithosis, you need to be immaculately clean in their cages. You've got to clean them up every day. The best way you do it is to rip newspaper, if you like, in the bottom of the cage cages. Yeah. And keep lifting the newspaper out and replacing it, if you like. That lifts the droppings out because they'll just keep reinfecting themselves. If you've got right. deep litter in the bottom of your cages, like you know sawdust or whatever, the droppings yeah. will go down there. That 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 um, disease will sit there. The birds will end up picking it back up in their feet, they scratch their feet or whatever with a beak. They just reinfect themselves all the time. So you've got to try and break that cycle. And right. So you treat them, you treat them with a doxycycline, and because they can re- keep reinfecting themselves all the time, the recommendation is you treat them for 30, day, 30 days continuously. It's the only antibiotic or only disease that we you'd use a treatment for that length of time. Because right, if you use it for, you. I mean, you know. I think I recommend the last thing. Use it for 14 days. Most people use antibiotics between 7 and 14 days. But really, if your birds have got onithosis, it ought to be 30 days of treatment for. And keep them spotlessly clean the whole time during it. Got you. That's what you have to do. Yeah, yeah now I, I've seen... The um, length of treatment, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that it was recommended that prior to breeding season, having them on a, a sort of a, a, a very set... Um, what would you call it? Like a procedure, so... Yeah. very set sort of administration of drugs um, in order to try and obviously boost fertility in the birds so actually a, a 30 day sort of uh, period for, for treating them would, would probably be ideal then um, especially, particularly at the start of the season actually to boost fertility so possibly you could possibly do that yeah I, I wouldn't necessarily be an advocate of that because for the reasons I've mentioned earlier on you start doing that and before you know it you've got a big table and a big list I'm going to treat them for canker before the breeding season. Oh I'm yeah, treat yeah. them with cooks. You end up with about half a dozen serious drugs that you're using to treat all these different diseases. Now, yeah, it might help their, their it might help their, um, the breeding results, but it might damage them as well. <laughs> yeah. You know? So yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd subscribe to to give them an ornithosis treatment for 30 days before I bred. Set up for me. I'm not sure I'd do that. Yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. If the birds, if the birds, if there's an outbreak or on the forces during the breeding season, I treat it then. And I mean, yeah. I, I mentioned it in the first video, Paul Harris, a great boy, Paul Harrison, actually, um, from down in Cumbria. Paul did a lot of work on the forces and discovered it in his birds. And I'll never forget the year that he, he had that in his birds. Um, you know, myself and Bob Hasty went down to see him a couple of times and whatnot. And, you know, Paul was. Talking about the problems he had with the birds and you, young chicks, N- N- Norwich canaries, nest to five, chicks sticking their heads out the first couple of days to be fed, and the heads would go down and it's gurgling and bubbling. You know the bubbles coming out just because yeah. they were choking on their on their own saliva and stuff like that. He had a torrid time in it, yeah. But he actually, and I think I mentioned before as well, he, he treated them first for going like for atoxoplasmosis, you know, coccidiosis. That's what the vets thought they had. Gave them a sulfur drug, didn't really help. Then eventually they discovered it was ornithosis and gave him a doxycycline treatment. Paul gave his birds a complete dose, 30 day dose of doxycycline, smack in the middle of the breeding season. And he bred over 100 Norwich that year. He was wow. treating the birds when they were breeding and there wasn't a problem. They were breeding yeah. like mice after it. Once he took it up, once he got the, the disease under control, those birds bred fantastic, even when he was still treating with a drug. So rather than sort of go along and give them a 30 day treatment before the breeding season, I'd probably wait and see what happens. And if the breeding season starts to become a problem and you, you see that issue, treat them then. Got you. That's what I'd do personally. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, Some fair enough. Some people might disagree with that. Yeah. Well, that takes us to the end of our questions. So thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Any tips you'd like to share? Um, no, there was, there was only kind of one that I thought about. I, I don't think I mentioned this the last time we were speaking. You know, we were talking about the sort of going light and the... Um, you're know, treating young green finches for atoxoplasmosis is going light in, in, in the breeding season. One thing I don't think I mentioned, would, and that would be that when you get through the breeding season, you breed the stack of birds, do not 
try it, well, try if you, if you possibly can. As soon as the birds are weaned and they're feeding themselves, get them away from the adults. Yeah. Try not to keep the adults beside them, right? Because whether it's atoxoplosis, atoxoplasmosis, or whether it's chlamydiosis or onithosis or something else, the adult birds will infect the young birds. A lot of these diseases, the adult birds can carry them perfectly healthily and never have a problem. But yeah. in their droppings, they're, they're passing these diseases in their droppings all the time. And if you've got the little small birds, you know, greenlings, if you like, in the same aviary or the same cage as these adult birds, those chicks are going to get infected constantly. So I'd, as soon as they're self-sufficient, the chicks, I would get them away from the adults. And there's no way I'd molt, I'd molt the adults by side chicks, ever. I'd always keep them separate. It's the way I always used to do it. You know, yeah. you know when I, when I got, got the young greenfinches weaned, I'd have a load of youngsters in an aviary. And maybe the next aviary would be a load of youngsters in that one or whatever. But there'd never be adults beside them. I'd always keep the adults away. And when I molted them through, again, once at the end of breeding season, I'd maybe take six adult hens, put them in an aviary, let them molt together. Next aviary, six adult hens, maybe again molting together. Next aviary, six adult cocks molting together. But never yeah. chicks beside them. Next aviary might have six or eight young birds in it molting together, but never adults beside them. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. The adults will Got just you. keep reinfecting the chicks. Now, the only, you know, I saw, I saw a guy on Facebook the other day there saying he had, he had bred some nice bullfinches and they looked really healthy birds that were dropping like flies. And I don't know, I mean, my, my guess is maybe, maybe they've, they've probably more than likely got coccidiosis, than what I thought. Um, but I do wonder if he's got them still beside adult birds. Yeah. And if he has, that could be causing the problem. I'd get them away from the adults. Now, I know with some birds it's hard to do that. I used to bring goldfinches years ago and they were absolute murder. You know, you'd, you'd have gold, you know, you have a nest of goldfinches in the adults and the young chicks would be getting big, their tails would be the full length to be feeding themselves. And I'm thinking, right, it's time to wean them. I'll put them in every next door. So why, why, you know, why between the two two averies? I yeah. take the chicks and put them in every next door. Next minute, bang, 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 they're all going dead. They just seem to go off sometimes. Goldfinches in particular, often when you move them to a different avery or or from one cage into a cage next door, they just seem to go off and, and put their heads under the wing. So it can be more difficult to do that with goldfinches split, splitting from the adults. But with greenies and all these other birds, red poles, get them split up as soon as you can. Take them away from the adults and mop the chicks. You know the, the Greenlands and the Navy themselves yeah. are the keys themselves are way from adults. Don't don't keep the adults beside them. Okay. That would be my recommendation for tonight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just any ideas as to why goldfinch just sort of drop like that? Well, I don't know. I don't know actually. Um, it's heartbreaking when it happens. I know lots of people it's happened to as well. That you know, you move them. You know, even when you move them to the Navy next door and they can see the adult ones through the wire, they, st- they still go off. Not yeah. always, but some of them do it. I don't know. I, I think it's, it's a coccidiosis type disease if infection they've got, and for some reason, moving them stresses them. And with that stress they feel, bang, the immune system dips. And phew, yeah. before you know it, the coccidiosis right. goes mad and, and, and kills them quickly. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's, got you. that's what I think happens. But you've got a young goldfinch, just keep them as stress free as you possibly can until they're well through the molt. Yeah. No? Wow. Other wow. Birds, red, yeah. red post siskins. You know, green finches, not a problem. Split them up, they're fine, usually. Never a problem. Gold finches, yes. they just seem to suffer from stress so easily and it, and it knocks them down, you know? Yeah, or, that, that's... I mean, the other, the other thing you can do as well is you're going to split them up from adults. Put put them on, on um, what you call it? Put them on them bay, baycocks for a couple of days before you you move them. Yeah. And I'll just protect them in case they do get stressed and the baycocks isn't in the system. Yeah, that's, Might a good, protect them, stop yeah them. that's a good idea, actually. I might try that. I mean, hopefully I'll be able to get some goldies on the sticks. I've had a nightmare this year with them, but... Have you? Uh, yeah, yeah, just not rearing. So, yeah. Uh, well, Dave, that good. takes us to the end. So no thank problem. you very much uh, for coming on. And, uh, well, we Pleasure. might be back for part three. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right, we'll find something different to talk about next time. Then. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Now, I hope you found that video useful and you enjoyed it. Please remember, our sponsor is Avian World Dublin. You can get so many different bird supplies from them, especially if you're in Ireland, but it's also doing now shipping to the UK. The link is in the description. So thank you, Avian World Dublin, Dotty Real, for sponsoring Natives in Norwich. Now, that does bring us to the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and you found it useful. If you have found it useful and you did enjoy the video, please smash that like button and subscribe down below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.